வணக்கம் இது தமிழ் அண்டத்தின் திறவுகோள் இந்த உலகத்தில் வாழும் அனைவரும் தமிழர்களே அனைத்து தமிழர்களுக்கும் என் பணிவான வணக்கம் இன்று நாம் பார்க்க இருப்பது எகிப்து மொழி ஆராய்ச்சியில் நம்மிடம் தற்போது இல்லாத உயர் தொழில்நுட்ப உச்சம் காடினர் ஜி தேர்ட்டி நைன் நாள் பதினான்கு எட்டு இரண்டாயிரத்தி இருபது பதிப்பு ஒன்று புள்ளி ஒன்று மூன்று எனது முதல் விழியத்தை பார்க்காதவர்கள் அதை பார்த்துவிட்டு இந்த விழியத்தை பார்க்க தொடருங்கள் அதில் எகிப்து மொழி பற்றியும் கட்டுடைக்கும் சூத்திரம் பற்றியும் விரிவாக கூறியுள்ளேன் அந்த விழியத்தின் பெயர் தமிழ் மொழி ஐயாயிரம் வருடம் பழமையானதா எகிப்து மொழி தமிழா நாம் குறிப்பிடக்கும் சில புத்தகங்கள் காடினர் சயின் லிஸ்ட் லிஸ்ட் ஆஃப் ஹீரோகிளிஃபிக் சயின்ஸ் பை அலன் காடினர் எஜிப்ஷியன் ஹீரோகிளிஃபிக் டிக்ஷனரி பை இஏ வேலிஸ் பட்ச் மார்க் வைகஸ் டூ தௌசண்ட் எயிட்டீன் எடிஷன் டிக்ஷனரி த காட்ஸ் ஆஃப் த எஜிப்ஷியன்ஸ் பை இஏ வேலிஸ் பட்ச் ஏன்ஷியன்ட் எஜிப்ஷியன் எ லிங்குஸ்டிக் இன்ட்ரொடக்ஷன் பை ஆண்டோனியோ லோப்ரினோ சேஷ் கமத் எஜிப்ஷியன் ஸ்கிரை ஃபோனாலஜி அண்ட் ஃபோனடிக் ரீகன்ஸ்ட்ரக்ஷன் ப்ராஜெக்ட் முதல் ஆறு பாகத்தை பார்க்காதவர்கள் அதை பார்த்து விடுங்கள் இதன் இணைப்பு விடியத்தின் கீழே கொடுக்கப்பட்டுள்ளது பிரமிட் உச்சியில் இருக்கும் கூறுகளான பென்பென் கல்லை பற்றி பார்த்து கொண்டிருக்கிறோம் பிரமிட் பென்பென் கல்லில் பெண்ணு என்ற பறவை இருப்பதாகவும் பெண்ணு என்கிற பெண்ணை ஆகிய அன்றில் அறிவால் முக்கன்தான் ஃபீனிக்ஸ் அதாவது பனைக்கி என்று கிரேக்கத்தில் அழைக்கப்படும் பனங்கிலிதான் ஃபீனிக்ஸ் என்று பார்த்தோம் அறிவால் மூக்கன் அறிவால் மூக்கன் தான் அறிவால் முக்கன் அதாவது மூன்றாவது கண்ணாகிய அறிவுக்கண் இதனால் தான் பிரமிட் உச்சியில் இருக்கும் பெண்பெண் கல்லில் மூன்றாவது கண்ணாகிய அறிவுக்கண் போடப்பட்டுள்ளது என்று பார்த்தோம் எல் எல்லாகி என்று குறிப்பிடப்படும் நடுகள் வழிபாடு போல நாம் முன்னோர்களின் எண்ண அலைகள் இந்த பிரமிட் கூறுகளான பெண்பெண் கல்லில் இருப்பதாகவும் சென்ற விடயங்களில் பார்த்தோம் பிளாக் ஹோல் என்பதுதான் அப்பன் என்றும் கருப்பட்டி நெற்றிக்கண் ஆமையன் காவடி அனைத்தும் ஒரே உருதான் என்றும் இதை பிரமிட் கூறு ஆன பெண்பெண் கல்லில் உள்ளது என்றும் சென்ற பாகங்களில் பார்த்தோம் அதன் தொடர்ச்சியாக தனி கூறாக சுடப்பட்ட அப்பம் தானிய கூரையாக சூடப்பட்ட அப்பன் தானிய கூரை தானியங்கள் இருக்கும் கூரைதான் ஆம் பிரமிட் உச்சியில் இருக்கும் பெண்பெண் கல்லை தானிய கூரை என்றே குறிப்பிடுகிறார்கள் நாம் நமது கோயில் கோபுர கலசத்தில் தானியங்களை தான் நிரப்புகிறோம் இதன் பொருள் என்ன வாருங்கள் பார்ப்போம் இன்சென்ஸ் சாம்பிராணி சமப்பார்னி ஆம் ஒவ்வொரு உயிரும் ஒரு பார் அதாவது ஒரு கிரகத்தை போல் என்று குறிப்பிடுகிறார்கள் அண்டத்தில் இருப்பதுதான் பிண்டத்தில் உள்ளது என்று நம் முன்னோர் கூறியுள்ளனர் சட்டமுனி ஞானம் என்னும் சித்தர் அண்டத்தில் உள்ளதே பிண்டம் பிண்டத்தில் உள்ளதே அண்டம் அண்டமும் பிண்டமும் ஒன்றே அறிந்துதான் பார்க்கும் போதே என்பார் இதைதான் திருமூலர் பிண்டத்துள் உற்ற பிழைக்கடை வாசலை அண்டத்துள் உற்று அடுத்தடு தேக்கிடில் வண்டிச்சிக்கு மலர்குழல் மாதரார் கண்டிச்சிக்கு நற்காயமுமாமே என்கிறார் அண்டத்தில் இருப்பதுதான் பிண்டத்தில் உள்ளது என்று நம் முன்னோர் கூறியதை குவாண்டம் பிசிக்ஸ் மூலம் அறிய முற்படுவோம் சற்று பெரிய காணொலி தான் ஆனால் அனைவரும் தெரிந்து கொள்ள வேண்டிய ஒன்று சற்று பொறுமையுடன் முழு காணொலியையும் பாருங்கள் That moment at the beginning of the 20th century signaled a genuine revolution because it demonstrated that the kind of uh, physical science that people were doing right back to Newton and Laplace and people like that that you needed a completely new approach physics has never recovered from that moment in the sense that it's built on that moment that's where modern physics really began But Einstein's theory also left physicists with a dizzying paradox, defying all common sense. Light was definitely a wave which explained shadows and bubbles. And now it was definitely a particle too, Einstein's quanta, explaining the photoelectric effect and the ultraviolet catastrophe. Then just a few years after Einstein's brilliant crazy idea, the paradox got a lot deeper and a whole lot weirder because what seemed to be a curious mystery about light was about to become a battleground about the nature of reality itself in 1922 The Western world is in the grip of a revolution, a cultural revolution. James Joyce's Ulysses is published, 
Stravinsky is at the height of his powers, and Chaplin has just released his first serious movie. The Ottoman Empire collapses. Europe is still recovering from the war to end all wars in which millions of men lost their lives. Russia is newly communist. Meanwhile, America is exporting jazz to the world. Thank you. In art, politics, literature, economics, there was an insatiable appetite for change. This was the birth of modernism. You got a heart that there's no way of knowing. Can see where you are, but can't see where you're going. And I'm stuck here still. I'm tangled up with you. This whole world can be so uncertain. But, but and I might get into trouble for saying this. I would argue that the upheaval that took place in physics at this time would eclipse them all and have far longer lasting consequences. It had begun with the discovery of the weird and contradictory wave particle nature of light. It ended up as an epic battle fought between the greatest minds in science for the highest possible stakes, the nature of reality itself. On one side, a new wave of modernist revolutionary scientists and their leader, the brilliant Danish physicist, Niels Bohr. On the other side, the voice of reason, Albert Einstein, at the height of his powers and now world famous, a formidable adversary. The battle raged for decades. Actually, in some ways, it still does. It was fought across the world in universities, at conferences, in bars and cafes. It would reduce grown men to tears. And it began with a deceptively simple experiment. This whole world can be so uncertain. But weirdly, it was an experiment that wasn't even about light. It was about the particles that make electricity. In the mid-1920s, an experiment was carried out at Bell Laboratories in New Jersey in America, which uncovered something entirely unexpected about electrons. Now, at the time, it was accepted without question that electrons were these tiny lumps of matter, small but solid particles like miniature billiard balls. In the experiment, they fired a beam of electrons at a crystal and watched how they scattered. Now, that's entirely equivalent to taking a beam of electrons, say, from an electron gun and firing it at a screen with two slits in it so that the electrons pass through the slits and hit another screen at the back. What the Bell scientists found shocked the physics world to the core. To understand why, consider a similar experiment with water waves. I've set up a simple experiment. I have a water ripple tank placed on top of an overhead projector. I have a generator producing waves that pass through two narrow gaps. The projector beams the image of the waves onto the back wall. You can see as the waves come in from the left and squeeze through the two gaps, they spread out on the other side and interfere with each other. What this means is that when you get the crest from one wave meeting the crest from another, they add up to make a higher wave. But when the crest from one meets a trough, they cancel out. This gives rise to these characteristic lines leading to the signature wave pattern. Bands of light and dark. Whenever you see these light and dark bands, the signature wave pattern, you know without doubt that you've got wave-like behavior. So guess what they saw in New Jersey? 
Now it's seen that firing electrons, tiny solid particles through the two gaps, produced exactly the same kind of pattern, bands of light and dark. First, light, for a long time believed to be a wave, was found to sometimes behave like particles. And now electrons, for a long time believed to be particles, were behaving like waves. But it was actually stranger than that. The wave pattern wasn't merely some result of the entire beam of electrons. More recently, this experiment has been repeated in labs around the world by firing one electron at a time through the slits onto the screen. At first, each electron seems to land randomly on the screen. But gradually, a pattern forms. The signature wave pattern. Let me be quite clear about just how weird this is. Remember from the wave tank experiment where the signature wave pattern only exists because each wave passes through both slits and then its two pieces interfere with each other. But here, every individual electron, each single particle, is passing alone through the slits before it hits the screen. And yet, each single electron is still contributing to the signature wave pattern. Each electron has to be behaving like a wave. To explain this strange result, Niels Bohr and his colleagues created quantum mechanics, a crazy theory of light and matter that embraced contradiction and didn't care that it was almost impossible to understand. As Niels Bohr himself said, anyone who isn't shocked by quantum theory hasn't understood it. So, viewers, I'm going to take our tiny electron and use it to delve deep into the heart of reality. And, yes, prepare to be shocked, because this is the only way to explain what we observe when a single electron travels through the slits and hits the screen. Quantum mechanics says this. We can't describe what's travelling as a physical object. All we can talk about are the chances of where the electron might be. This wave of chance somehow travels through both slits producing interference just like the water wave. Then, when it hits the screen, what was just the ghostly possibility of an electron mysteriously becomes real. Let me try and capture just how weird this is with an analogy. If I spin this coin... then all the time it's spinning, it's a blur. I can't tell if it's heads or tails. But if I stop it, I force it to decide, and it's heads. So before, it was sort of not heads or tails, but a mixture of both. But as soon as I've stopped it, I've forced it to make up its mind. This is what Bohr and his supporters claimed was happening with our electrons. In a sense, as it spins, the coin is both heads and tails. Similarly, the electron's wave of chance passes through both slits, two paths at the same time. Our coin then stops at heads. The ethereal wave of probability hits the screen and only then becomes a particle. The quantum world was unlike anything ever seen before. It's hard to overstate just how crazy this is. Bohr was effectively claiming that one can never know where the electron actually is at all until you measure it. And it's not just that you don't know where the electron is. It's weirdly as though the electron itself is everywhere at once. Bear in mind that electrons are among the commonest and most basic building blocks of reality. And yet, here's Bohr saying that only by looking do we actually conjure their position into existence. It's like there's a curtain between us and the quantum world, and behind it, there is no solid reality. Just the potential for reality.
Things only become real when we pull back the curtain and look. And this view, ladies and gentlemen, became known as the Copenhagen interpretation. Persuasive as it might seem, many people couldn't stomach Niels Bohr's outlandish ideas. And they found a natural leader in the most powerful man in science. Albert Einstein hated this interpretation with every fiber of his being. He famously said, does the moon cease to exist when I don't look at it? He was very unhappy because it uh, gave limits to knowledge that he didn't think should be final. He thought there should be a, a better underlying theory. Over the next 10 years, Einstein and Bohr would argue passionately about whether quantum mechanics meant giving up on reality or not. Then, with two other scientists, Nathan Rosen and Boris Podolsky, Einstein thought they'd found a way to win the argument. He was convinced he'd found a fatal flaw in the Copenhagen interpretation, and its claim that reality was summoned into existence by the act of looking at it. At the heart of Einstein's argument was an aspect of quantum mechanics called entanglement. Now, entanglement is this special, incredibly close relationship between a pair of quantum particles whose fates are intertwined. For example, if they were created in the same event. Let me try and explain this by imagining the two particles are spinning coins. Imagine these coins are two electrons, created from the same event and then moved apart from each other. Quantum mechanics says that because they're created together, they're entangled. And now many of their properties are forever linked, wherever they are. Remember, the Copenhagen interpretation says that until you measure one of the coins, neither of them is heads or tails. In fact, heads and tails don't even exist. And here's where entanglement makes this weird situation even weirder. When we stop the first coin and it becomes heads, because the coins are linked through entanglement, the second coin will simultaneously become tails. And here's the crucial thing. I can't predict what the outcome of my measurement will be, only that they will always be opposite. Einstein seized on this because it meant that something was happening between the two coins that was almost too crazy to imagine. It's as if the two coins are secretly communicating, communicating instantaneously across space and time, even if the first coin was on Earth and the other was on Pluto. Einstein refused to believe this instantaneous, faster-than-light communication. His theory of relativity said that nothing could travel that fast, not even information. So how could one coin instantaneously know how the other would land? He disparagingly called it spooky action at a distance and claimed it was a fatal flaw in the Copenhagen interpretation. What's more, he had a better idea. Einstein believed there was a simpler interpretation, that somehow the destiny of the two coins, whether or not they ended up heads or tails, was already fixed long before we observed them. He said that although it seemed the coin was deciding to be, say, heads at the moment of observation, actually that decision was taken long before. It was just hidden from us. In Einstein's mind, quantum particles were nothing like spinning coins. They were more like, say, a pair of gloves, left and right, separated into boxes. We don't know which box contains which glove until we open one. But when we do and find, say, a right-handed glove, then immediately we know that the other box contains the left-handed glove. But crucially, this requires no spooky action at a distance. Neither glove has been altered by the act of observation. 
Both of them were either left or right-handed glove from the beginning. And the only thing that has changed is our knowledge. So which is the true description of reality? Bohr's coins, which only become real when we look at them, and then magically communicate to each other? Or Einstein's gloves, which are hidden from us, but are definitely left or right from the beginning? In other words, is there an objective reality, as Einstein believed, or not, as Bohr maintained? In the late 1930s, as the world plunged into war, there was no way to answer this question. The battle to understand the nature of reality was deadlocked. The war rolled across Europe, and many of the leading scientists fled to the United States. Then, as the Second World War led inexorably to the Cold War, American science, backed by dollar bills and a new vision of the future, boomed. Remember, after the war, physicists came back raring to go and try to apply uh, the uh, ideas of, of, of quantum theory to, uh, to, to atoms, the interaction between electrons and, and light and what have you. You didn't need to worry about the philosophical side of things uh, to make progress with that. So, as you say, it really took a back seat. Quantum mechanics led to a profound understanding of semiconductors, which helped create the modern electronic age. It produced lasers, revolutionizing communications, breathtaking new medical advances, and breakthroughs in nuclear power. Quantum mechanics was so successful that most working physicists deliberately chose to ignore Einstein's objections. It simply didn't matter to them because it worked. They even coined a phrase for it, shut up and calculate. And the price for this success was that Bohr and Einstein's debate on the reality of the quantum world was simply brushed under the carpet. And amidst all this success and pragmatism, there were few who still worried what it all meant. But as the 50s rolled headlong into the 60s, one lone dissenter worked out how to settle the argument once and for all. Nam parta de or Siru Padridan, Muru Kanalayum, Inaipa Kide, Kurtulin, Iranda Pangalayum, Murumayaga Parangal, or Minan Galai, or Ida Velil, Payam Seidal, Yepadi Alai Katrai, Adavadu, Band Uruahumo, Ade Pol, Uru Uru Minan Waha, Tanitaniaha, Anipi, and the Yiri Ida Velil, Payam Seidalum, Ade Alai Katrai than Uruahurid. In the Yiru Nana and Galai, Uru Mulatil Yirundu, Vanda Uru Minan Waha, Ninetu Kondal, Uru Minanu, Yinur Minan Udan, Totabil Irikirid. Idil Wuru Minanu, Puvi Ilum, Matrondru, Pluto Gregatil Irundalum, Irandum, Totarbil Erikred, Wuru Anu, Yena Seye Vendum Endru, Matrondru, Mudu Segred. Niels Bohr and Bavar, Quantum Theory Patri, Yena Kurihira and Ral, Nam Mayana Purul, Yendra Kuru Manitume, Mayatra Purula Anadi. Melum over Kurihira, Yar Wuru Quantum Theory Paditu, Via Padea Villayo, Avakal Quantum Theory Purindukola Villa Yendra Kurihira. Nam Munor, Idaidan, Nam Kanba the Maya Yendrum, Palai and Burdangalik Munar, Kuriulaner. Ida Naki Rer, Ahana Nur, Nuti Napati, Wondram Padalil, Marekal, Ningi, Maha Visumbil, Kurumuyal, Maraniram, Killer Madi, Nirainda, Arumin Serum, Mahavirul, Nadanal, Maruh Vilakurut, Maya Tuki, Paraviral Mudur, Palarudan, Tuandria, Vidavudan, Nayara, Varhatil, Amma, Yendra Kurira. அடுத்த பகுதியில் இன்னும் விரிவாக பார்ப்போம்